Today I am going to be um, preaching to you from my Battle Ready series. So there is a Battle Ready series that I have been doing, and I don't know about you, but I have just been fighting things out in the Spirit. And, you know, when we are trying to fight things out in the Spirit, I want to make sure that I'm fighting things, but I want to make sure I'm fighting spiritually. I don't want to fight it out physically because I'm not big enough to fight it out spirit or physically. I want to fight it out spiritually the way the Word of God tells me to. So I'm going to go, the sermon title this morning is called A Healed Heart. So I'm going to be preaching from the strategy of what is it like when our heart is completely healed and we are operating and thinking with our heart. And I know that sounds a little odd right now, but when I read the Word of God, you'll understand it. Let's go to the Lord of Prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for your presence that we have already felt in this house this morning. We thank you, Father, because we praise you. We worship you. We give you all glory and honor because you are the King of kings. You are the Lord of lords. There is no one above you. We just give you all praise, all honor this morning, Lord. We ask you to come down into uh, this service, Lord. We ask you to uh, just uh, anoint every word that's spoken, Lord. Give us the ears to hear what you're saying. Give us the eyes to see. And give us the ability to react to it. Let our actions be spiritually minded this morning so that we can draw closer to you, so that we can live out your word in full abundance because that's what we want. I declare and decree that these next few mo moments that I am going to be delivering this word, Lord, that you're going to use me as your instrument. Remove all flesh. Remove all flesh and just speak through me. And I thank you for what you're doing in our hearts and lives, in the church and through your people. In the name of Jesus, we say amen. So looking at the scripture that I'm going to be using, preaching from a healed heart, I'm going to the Word of God, and I'm going to the Amplified Version, and I'm going to Luke 5, Luke 5, 17 through 22. A lot of times when ministers are preaching on this, they're preaching on the topic of friendship and how you need to have wonderful friends. And wonderful friends are great to have, but that's a, that's a good thing. But I'm going to something different with this. Luke 5, 17 through 22. One day, as he was teaching, there were Pharisees and teachers of the law sitting there who had come from every village of Galilee and Judea and from Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was present with him to heal. Some men came carrying on a stretcher a man who was paralyzed, and they tried to bring him in and lay him down in front of Jesus. But finding no one to bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and removed some tiles to make an opening and lowered him through the tiles with his stretcher into the middle of the crowd in front of Jesus. That's the kind of friend I want. That is the kind of friend that will take the roof off of the place when I need Jesus. But going on, when Jesus, verse 20, when Jesus saw their active faith springing from confidence in him, he said, man, your sins are forgiven. The scribes and the Pharisees began to consider and question the implications of what he had said, saying, who is this man who speaks blasphemies by claiming the rights and prerogatives of God? Who can forgive sins, that is, remove guilt, nullify sin's penalty, and assign righteousness except for God alone? And here's the, here's the scripture that I want to focus on. Verse 22. But Jesus, knowing their hostile thoughts, but Jesus, knowing their hostile thoughts, answered them, Why are you questioning these things in your heart? Why are you questioning these things in your heart? And when I read that, it spoke volumes to me because I know that my thoughts, I have been trained that my thoughts come from my brain. It comes from my mind. But how can I think? from my heart? How can I have hostility in my heart? So this morning I want to talk to you, are our hearts and are our minds at war with, either, with, with each other? Is my heart capable of thinking? Think about that for a moment. You know, the scripture, going back to verse 22 again, but Jesus, knowing their hostile thoughts, answered them, why are you questioning these things in your 
heart, in your heart. So this morning I want to pose a question. Can my analytical mind understand the depths of God's love and his plan for my life? You know, when I am thinking and I'm putting forth all of this thought and the Lord speaks to me, if I'm only thinking with my brain and I'm not thinking with my heart, I'm going to be more proactive than reactive. When I am proactive, I hear a word from the Lord and I say, God, I heard you, but I don't know. I want to think about this first. I want to check this out. If I do option A over here, like you're telling me to do, I see all of this pain. I see all of this heartache with option A. So I'm going to choose option B because I don't see any heartache there. And I'm going to do that. I'm going to use my mind, and that's what I'm going to do. But God wants us to get to a place where we hear him and we react to him with our heart. And I know that it's bad when you are a leader, whether you're a leader in your career, um, on your job, in your family, you always want to be a proactive leader and not a reactive leader because when you're reacting, it means you're following. You're following behind someone. But God wants us to be reactive to him. When we are fully obedient to him, he wants to say one time, get up and move. And we don't question it. We just get up and move. And so that's where I want to go this morning. How do we get to the place to where we can be reactive when God speaks? How can we be reactive when God speaks? Many of us trust our mind more than we trust our heart. Our mind is where our logic resides. It's where we have sound judgment. It's where we make all of our decisions, but we separate it from our emotions. And our heart is where we hold emotions. It's where we can have a broken heart because of pain and because of sorrow. It's when we are feeling all of the emotions of struggles, of trials. It resides in our heart. So sometimes we can even act impulsively because of the emotions that we're feeling in our hearts. We were taught as young children to value our mind more than our heart because our emotions can be up and down. One minute you are feeling good, the next minute you're not. And we're taught to always look at the facts, to think with our mind, to make judgments with our minds. Our emotions can get easily out of control, so it's best if we're led by our mind. Our mind is logical, it's more reasonable than our heart. But not only our, are our emotions unpredictable, our emotions are always changing. They're up and down, they're never the same. But the Bible says that the heart is morally corrupt and more deceitful than anything else. In Jeremiah 17 and 9 in the New, uh, New International Version, the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? So we've been taught, and we even have scripture where we base this on the word of God. I need to watch my heart. I need to keep my heart in check. We grow up thinking that our heart can't be trusted. It, would be, it wouldn't be safe for me to open the door to my heart and allow my heart to be more discerning in my life because it's better if I just completely uh, just press, press it down, completely just keep trying to hold the emotions in. More thinking and less heart. More thinking and less heart. So it's no wonder that people have heart attacks because they're burying the emotions. When you have a heart attack, you get so stressed out, and it will actually create a heart attack because you get a blood clot, and it blocks your artery going into your heart, and the oxygen cannot uh, take the blood, and oxygen cannot go, cannot flow through your blood, and when that happens, it starves your heart of oxygen. Our hearts are starving this morning. Our hearts are starving this morning. We need to have a healed heart. We can allow the Holy Spirit to come in and to comfort us and to, and to deposit hope and healing in our heart. 
It's true that our heart can be morally corrupt. It's true that we need to do a work in our heart. But in Ezekiel, there were two instances where the word of God says, I will remove your heart of stone and give you a new heart. God can give us a new heart, no matter what the pain is, no matter how much the sorrow is, no matter what we're carrying, God will remove your heart of stone and he will give you a new heart. Our heart can be healed. And when it's healed, it becomes an entryway for God's power. It becomes a voice for us to listen to, for God to show us his path and his will for our lives. In Romans 10 and 10 in the New King James Version, it says, For with, for with the heart one believes unto righteousness. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness. If you go back and if you look in the Old Testament, the Israelites believed that the heart and the mind were connected. They considered them one thing. It was almost like our lungs. We consider our lungs to be one. Um, we have two separate lungs, but they're considered to be one. Our kidneys are the same way. The Hebrews or the Israelites, they thought of the heart and mind in that instance in that same way. They didn't separate them like we do today, and they didn't make one more valuable than the other. They worked together with a purpose and a plan. The heart was seen as more of a source of our emotions, and the Hebrews considered it to be a source of a person's will. You know, we say that we want the Lord's will, but when we're operating in our own will, making those choices, they considered that to come from the heart. Our moral conduct, where we consider right and wrong, came from the heart for the Israelites. Their spiritual life, their spirit man, came from their heart. Their thought life came from their heart. In Proverbs 15 and 14, it says, The discerning heart seeks knowledge. The discerning heart seeks knowledge. It's so important for us to know that our heart can speak to us and guide us through struggles and through battles. Many of, of us believe that the mind thinks and the heart feels, but according to scripture, it doesn't actually happen that way. Feelings and thoughts can come from our own heart, and our mind expresses both feelings and heart or both feelings and thoughts too. So what we have to do when our heart and mind are one, it allows us to think clearly. We think fully in the spirit. We operate fully in the spirit. It's like they are working together to solve a puzzle. Let me give you this example. The Lord has worked through me prophetically for decades now. I will get a word from the Lord. When I was very spiritually immature and the gifts were there, this is why you have to always watch your um, your gifts, because your gifts are wonderful. They, they come to you at birth, but your spiritual maturity you have to work on, so you have to learn how to operate in your gifts effectively. So I had the gift of prophecy. I had the gift of discernment. I had the gift of knowledge, where I would get a word from the Lord for somebody, and I would run to that person, and I would say, I've got a word for you, and I would release it, and they would look at me like, Okay, I don't get that. You know, I don't get that. The Lord had to show me why he was giving me those words. And he gives me words almost like a puzzle, almost like a riddle. And this is just the way that the Lord talks to me. And so a lot of times I get these puzzles and riddles from the Lord. Sometimes they relate to Bible scripture. Sometimes they relate to my life. Sometimes they're an intermingling of several different things. But I will get... Uh, a riddle or a puzzle from the Lord about somebody that I need to pray for. So I've got this word, and I have had to learn over the years to not release it because it's a way, really what the Lord is, is doing is having me intercede for that person. So I'm praying, and as I am praying and interceding, and I have this word, and I'm saying, Lord, tell me what this word means. Then the Lord begins with my analytical mind, I'm listening to him through my heart, and with my analytical mind, I start using my analytical mind to put the pieces of the puzzle together. As he gives me revelation through my heart, 
I begin to put the pieces of the puzzle together with my analytical mind. So my heart and the revelation of God is working with my analytical mind to put the pieces of a puzzle together. So that's what I'm really talking to you about this morning, that when we are a Christian, we can use both our heart and our mind together. And it's really the best plan for our life. God can do something miraculous through using your heart and your mind together. It says in the word of God in Proverbs 23 and 7, For as he thinks in his heart, so is he. So this morning I want to talk to you about re, uh, reconnecting the heart and mind so that you can be fully healed and so that you can be fully used of God. Because we have to be able to operate in both. When we're operating just with our analytical mind, we are not being used fully by Christ. It's important for us to use our mind to reason through our way, wayward emotions or our negative emotions so that we can cast out fear, so that we can cast out worry and doubt. That's very important. But we also need to use our mind to just put the pieces of the puzzle together. The heart and mind work best when we use them together. Not trying to suppress our heart, but allowing it to be used to its fullest. So only when we are in touch with our heart can we fully connect to God. We can restore past relationships when we really start listening to our heart because he will soften our heart so that a broken relationship, we now have love for that person and we're wanting to restore that person more than anything. We can listen to our heart and suddenly Instead of thinking with, this is how this person wronged me with my mind, I'm thinking, Lord, you have softened my heart so much, and I love him. I love her. It's important for me to restore the relationship. We can be creative. We can think clearly. If you're having a hard time thinking clearly, it could be that you've rejected your heart, and you're not thinking with your heart, and you're pressing down your emotions. So how did our heart and our mind become separate? Why did we choose to make them separate? We got hurt. You think about this. You know, we make bad choices when we step away from God, when we're not being fully used of God. It's usually because there's some sort of pain there. We're hurt. And so we made this inner vow to not be hurt again. We made this inner vow, I'm not going to be hurt again. That person hurt me. They're never going to hurt me again. I'm not going to let them in. I've got a wall built up all around me. But here's the problem. When you make that inner vow and you've got this wall built up around you so that somebody can't get in to hurt you, it also, leave, it also keeps all of the good out. So you've got this wall surrounding you and nobody can get in. The bad can't get in, but the good can't get in either. You've made an inner vow and the good can't get in. You're keeping the bad out. I hate being laughed at. That was horrible. I'll never... I'll never be laughed at again. This person hurt me, and I'm going to do everything that I possibly can to make sure that I never get hurt again. I don't feel like I'm perfect. They made me feel like I was insignificant. So from this day forward, I will always be perfect. One of our main goals of an inner vow is I'm trying to protect myself. I don't want to be hurt again. So making that vow seems really good in the beginning, but over time, we continue to hurt ourselves. It's like the person hurt us in the beginning, but because of that wall that we build around us, now we're actually hurting ourselves because we're keeping love out from us. So no matter how great an inner vow is in the beginning, it will eventually lead us to more hurt and to more pain. A vow is our own human response to pain. It's our own human response to fear. I am afraid, so I'll never do that again. Every time we choose to rely on us instead of God, every time we decide to rely on our analytical mind, on us instead of God, we are choosing something man-made over God himself. We are choosing to walk away from God and to not be obedient to God because he has given us um, an, 
an order, a command. He's given us a word, and he's trying to pull us closer to him. But because we're walking away, we have the choice to walk away, and he'll let us get as far from him as we want. When we trust God, we get to experience the fullness of God's abundance. In Jeremiah 17 and 9, it says, Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose hope is the Lord. Trust in the Lord equals blessings. When we trust God, it means that blessings come down. An inner vow can quickly become an idol in our heart because it stands between us and our ability to trust God. Let me give you another example. I know this is a lot of teaching this morning. When I first began seeking the baptism of the Holy Ghost, I was probably, I don't know, 14, 15 years old, maybe a little bit older. And it took me a long time to receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. I would say around a decade is how long it took me to receive the baptism. The reason why, I, I created an inner vow for myself. I had been sexually abused as a child, and the one inner vow I made was, no one will ever control me again. I will never let anybody else control me again. So when I began seeking the Holy, the Holy Ghost, the baptism of the Holy Ghost, we have to fully surrender to God. We have to give Him control. And I could not do that. I had to actually surrender the vow before I could speak in tongues. And it took forever because I didn't even know that I had made that vow. So what's the unexpected twist with vows? We continue to hurt ourselves. We continue to hurt. We continue to sin. In James 2, 10 through 11, in the Passion Translation, it reads, For the one who attempts to keep all of the law of Moses but fails in just one point has become guilty of breaking the law in every respect. For the same one who tells us, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. Now, if you don't commit adultery, but you do commit murder, you are still guilty as a lawbreaker. So when we don't follow the leading of the Holy Spirit and we break the law, we break God's covenant, we are guilty of sin ourselves. If we break even one small point of God's law, we're guilty of breaking the whole law, is really what that means. So it's impossible to judge another person without being guilty of sin too. We reap what we sow. Those choices we make in life are powerful. In Matthew 18 and 18, the word of God reads, Truly I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. God honors the decisions of our heart in both ways. What we come into agreement with and what we come out of agreement with. We have to come into agreement with the word of God, but we do have to renounce those, inter, those inner vows that we've made that keep the word of God out of our heart. He created us to choose his ways for all eternity and not be forced to follow them. So every choice we make in our heart, good or bad, produces an outcome. Resentment never produces righteousness. We have, we're carrying around resentment. We're carrying around rejection, but we can't carry righteousness. We're carrying one or the other. When something is birthed in resentment, it cannot be holy. So how can I tell if I've made an inner vow? Most, and most inner vows are made in childhood because of your hurt, and you don't even realize that you've made them. And most, most cases, it's just like what I said. I vow I will never be out of control. I will never let somebody else uh, have control in my life. And so you make those vows, and you hold on to them over time, and you continue to just walk down that negative path where you're keeping people out. And this is one of the reasons why it can be difficult to actually recognize that you even have vows, those inner vows. Even if we can't remember making the vow, our actions will tell us that we have one. Because it doesn't typically take 10 years when they start seeking the Holy Ghost. When people start seeking the baptism of the Holy Ghost, it doesn't usually take a decade. It might take a month or two if they're really, really seeking. It might take a few weeks. It might be instantaneous. 
who, you know, my testimony is the only testimony that I can ever remember hearing somebody say it took them a decade. It was because of an inner vow that I had made. So we can tell there's a vow because we can see its fruit. It might be a negative fruit, but we can see its fruit. That conflict is a nightmare for us. We're walking into a negative plan. I can't handle this. I would much rather ignore this issue than uh, to just deal with it. I would much rather ignore it, push it down, not deal with the emotions. I want to base my life on fact and not emotions. Our reaction to conflict could be the root of a vow. So how do we reconnect our hearts and our minds? That's the question. How can we learn to trust God with our heart and to let him lead us heart first, the way he often wants to? First thing that we need to do, we need to learn to sit at Jesus' feet. We need to sit really in his lap like a child would. You know, when you see a young child, maybe, um, you know, an infant all the way up to two or three years old, they're so precious when you see them sitting in their mom and dad's lap, their grandparents' lap, because you can just see the love that abounds. They are looking at you, and they think that you can do everything. They have, they have complete and total trust in who you are as mom, and who you are as dad, and who you are as grandma and grandpa, Gigi, whatever you want to be called. Um, and they have complete and total trust. And that's how we need to look to Jesus. In Mark 10, 11, or in Mark 10 13 through 16, it says people were bringing little, cheap, little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them. But the disciples rebuked them. And when Jesus saw this, he was indignant. And he said to them, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them. For the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly, I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it, will never enter it. We need to have a life that is based on living our life for Jesus the way children do, with that trust, that complete and total trust, where we're just looking up going, God, I just need more, more of you. Give me everything this morning. The second thing that we need to do, other than to just sit in Jesus' lap and just trust him, the second thing, we need to renounce any vows that we've made as a child um, or as a young adult. We need to just renounce any of those vows that we've made um, and get rid of them in our lives because we don't need those because they're really creating a wall for us and they're holding us back. So how do we do that? How do we do that? If you feel like that you've made an inner vow, the first thing you have to do, you have to recognize that you've got it. That's the biggest thing. Vows, you know, are hard to recognize at first, but I will never sin. I will be a good person in every situation. I will not make mistakes. Do you hear how that is uh, demanding perfection? God never demands us to be perfect. God, God knows that we are imperfect. He knows that we're flesh. He created us that way. So vows... Uh, always stack up when you hear them or when you see them or when you realize that you have them in, their, in your life, it is, um, it's all or nothing. It's all or nothing. You are asking for perfection. Vows like those do not line up with the truth of Jesus and the cross. We've been forgiven because of the blood of Christ. And we know that our flesh is imperfect. If you feel like you get in trouble when you don't do everything perfectly, Take another look. Take another look. Because his love is, is not based on how you perform. God loves us because of who we are. He created us. You don't need to protect yourself from the love of Christ. God loves us. He's never going to hurt us. He's never going to walk away from us. We are his child. We are worthy. We are loved. We are more than enough. He loves us. He wants relationship with us. So how do we get rid of an inner vow? The first thing that we have to do is we have to take it to Jesus in prayer. We have to pray about it. We have to say, God, I release this to you. We have to, let, we have to um, express the pain of what we experience. We have to let go of that pain that we experience. We have to hurt. We have to actually forgive those who hurt us. We have to forgive those who hurt us. Let me say that again. We have to forgive those who hurt us. I just testified that I was abused sexually as a child. I had 
to forgive my abuser. In order for me to move on, I had to forgive. That's not easy to do. I realize that there are several people that have all sorts of hurts, different hurts, and you hold on to that hurt, but you have to forgive for you to move on. You have to forgive for you to move on. You have to repent of any sinful reactions. That means that when I was a teenager, a new Christian praying, and I was praying, and I was saying, Lord, just kill him, let him die. Just kill him, let him die. Have you ever prayed those kind of witchcraft prayers on people? I have. I'm being, I'm being transparent with you this morning. And you have got to repent of those sinful reactions. That was sin on, in my heart because of the way I was treated. So you have to let go and repent of that sin that you are carrying. And then once you've done that, once you've done everything, you just renounce that. You renounce the vow. God, I will no longer, uh, I will give control to you in every area of my life. I know that you are never going to hurt me. I know that you're always going to love me. So you can have complete and total control in any area of my life. I want more of you. I come into agreement. I, or I come out of agreement with this vow, and I repent for even making it in the first place. I nail it to the cross. And then I have to develop new vows. Or not new vows. I have to develop new habits. I have to begin letting people in. So if I said I'll never have friends again because I because they hurt me so badly, it doesn't mean I have to go back to the person that hurt me, but it does mean I have to allow somebody in. I have to begin developing a foundation of trust so that I can have friends. You have to trust again. So the third thing that you would do is you're going to reverse the lie. So you ask Jesus to reveal his truth to your heart and replace the lie. You speak that truth over and over to over, over and over to yourself, and it begins to feel like your reality. So God's truth becomes your reality um, when you have a very bad temper and you focus in on how impatient you can be with others or exploding on someone else, and that's what you focus in on all of the all of the time. Then you'll notice that your temper is always a problem. But if you begin focusing in on, Lord, I'm just going to try and be patient today. I'm going to try and give people more time. I'm going to try and give people more patience. I'm going to try and give them more love. And when you start doing that, you'll find out that you're creating a good habit. And you're going to start dwelling on those fruits of the spirit that are operating in your life instead of those negative emotions that you've been struggling with. Pray about all of these things and come into agreement with Jesus. And, and allow him to live in your heart in a different way than what he has in the past. Never doubt what God can do with your broken heart. I know that my heart has been completely crushed through different struggles and battles in my life. But with the breaking, God put it together, put me back together so much stronger, so much better, and so much healthier than what I've ever been, and I want to give him praise for that. It's time to give him all of the pieces. It's time to open up your heart again to fully forgive because God wants your heart first. He wants your heart first. Linda, if you would please come. What's the difference? I want to leave you with this this morning. What's the difference between trusting in God and trusting God? I know it sounds very basic, Sounds like it's really the same thing. What is the difference between trusting in God and trusting God? What is the difference between trusting in God and trusting God? To place your trust in someone is to believe that they are reliable. They are good. They are honest. They are trustworthy. It means that I physically take my trust and I hand it to God. God, I, I'm taking my trust. I trust in you. Here is my trust. I'm giving it to you. That's what trusting in God means. To simply be told to trust God, it's really a command. When I say I trust God, it means I'm listening to God in my heart. 
I hear what he's telling me to do. And I trust him so much that I react instinctively to his voice. I don't think about it. I don't try to plan it out, but I trust him. I trust him completely. And even if it looks like I'm walking right face to face into more pain, I trust that the Lord is going to carry me through it. So there's no, and to simply trust God, it's a command. There isn't a, a choice in the, in, in the language at all. I'm not choosing to give my trust to God. It's almost like a parent. My, my parents used to say this to me. They would say, they would give me a command. I want you to clean up your room. You know what a teenager says. They say, why? They say, why? So out of my mouth, I would say, why? And out of their mouth, they would say, because I said so. Because I said so. So when we trust God, we're doing a because I said so. We trust him so much, we just get up and do it because he said so. I put my trust in God implies that I have a choice. I face a struggle or a situation and I choose to trust him. But if I trust God, it means that I am really operating with a healed heart. That I'm really operating with everything in check. And that I'm listening the way that I need to. I don't worry because I trust God. Sounds like I never worry because I've always put my trust in God. He's taking care of it. It's his problem, not mine. I love to give my problems to the Lord. I love to give my burdens to the Lord. But I don't worry because I put my trust in God. That sounds like I do worry. But when I choose to give my worry to the Lord, that's when I trust him. So the more that we trust in God, the easier it is to trust God. It's like we are operating. One is we're operating with an analytical mind, trusting in God. When we trust God, we're operating from a healed heart. We're operating from that healed heart, and we're using both our heart and our mind together to work to put the plan of God together for our lives. He's using everything that we have. We're operating fully and completely in the best possible way so that we can truly be used by him to minister to others. Would you stand, church? I know this was kind of heavy on you this morning, but I really did want to give you some instruction on how to really fight the battle from a healed place, from a healed heart. Because each one of us have battle struggles. And when we battle those things, it's important for us to recognize where we could have went wrong in the past so that we don't make those same mistakes for our future. Because I always want to be used to my fullest for God. Heavenly Father, I pray for everyone today. I pray, God, that you would uh, just remove inner vows this morning, Lord. I pray, God, that you would show us those areas of our lives that might be out of order, where we have not given you complete and total control, where we haven't put our complete and total trust in you, Lord, because we want to be, we want to operate fully and completely for you. We want to be able to hear your voice completely. We want to be able to be used by you in uh, such a way that it is going to change every person that we come into contact with, Lord. I speak peace over minds today. I speak peace over hearts today. I declare and decree that the peace of God will be our portion. I declare and decree that we will walk in the love of Christ. That if we have been battling depression or fear or guilt or worry, that it is uh, just being cast down. It is just being broken off of us this morning. As we surrender everything to you, as we surrender those vows to you, Lord, we are giving it all to you because we know that when you are in control, that is the best place, that is the safest place for us to be, is to be completely wrapped around your arms, sitting in your lap, allowing you to completely minister to us. We want to trust you. We want to look up like that child, like that little bitty baby looks up 
to mama and daddy. We want to be right there looking up to you, knowing that, that you weren't the one who broke our heart. You weren't the one that walked away. You were never the one who hurt us. And we know that you're putting us back together stronger today. We know that you're putting us back together better today. Lord, I pray for anyone who might be here that is struggling with that heart of stone, Lord, that you would give them a new heart, that you would give them a new heart, that you would soften their heart, you would soften their heart so that they could hear the gospel message. If there's anyone under the sound of my voice who you have not made Christ your personal Savior, or you have walked away for a time, all you have to do to come back to the Lord you just have to accept him. You know that he is your personal savior. You know that he died on the cross. You have to believe in him. You have to accept him. You have to believe in him. You have to confess him as your Lord and savior. So if everybody would repeat after me, Heavenly Father, today I come to you a sinner in need of a savior. And I ask you to come into my heart. Wash me white as snow. Save me, deliver me, fill me with your spirit, make me whole, give me a new heart. I confess you as my Lord and Savior. I confess you as my Lord and Savior. I lay every inner vow down at your feet, and I give you control of my life. time or the first time in a long time, you are a Christian, and I want to welcome you into the family of God. We thank you all for coming today. Thank you all. If you want prayer, you can come up front.